And welcome back, everybody. This is Comorbidities 2, Wounds. Now, we're discussing wounds right now in comor comorbidities because it's such an important topic in gerontology. If you're working in a care team with an older population, you will be on the wound team, guaranteed. It's kind of a myth that nutrition can poor nutrition causes a wound. It does put a person more at risk, but it doesn't cause wounds, and we'll we'll get into that. You also though can't heal a wound if you don't have good nutrition. So, a dietitian's role in wound care and the role of nutrition is key to functioning. Now, before we go ahead, also, just a heads up warning. I don't know how to discuss wounds without showing wounds, so icky pictures here on. I'm not doing anything to gross you out on purpose, I promise, but I, I do need to show you some of this to explain what we're talking about. Some dietitians, I have found there's, there's two types. There are some that are just ghoulishly fascinated with wounds, which I am, and then there are some that just really can't stand them. So if you are in t camp two, I apologize. No, I'm not doing this to be mean. I, we just need to get through it, okay? And also, don't be too panicky. I know this is a big, chunky set of slides. It's not going to be that bad. We're going to go through this pretty quick. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so we're going to do some some terms first because, again, you will be involved with wounds and wound care, and it's important to know what the wound care team is talking about, the nurses involved. So some basic terminology here. Uh, you'll be discussing granulation. Granulation is the beginning of new connective tissue and microscopic blood vessels. These form on the wound bed. When the wound is beginning to heal, it's indicative of the healing process starting. So when you have a wound, it's a good sign when you see granulation. It means things are making a turn for the better. It looks a little bit like red, bubbly, kind of like caviar, if you've ever seen caviar. Um, or, I don't know, a lot of bath beads or something like that. Any, any kind of small, plasticky, clear, reddish-tinted beads. Okay. Uh, slough and eschar are things that you'll be discussing. Slough is wet, dead, wet, blah, blah, wet, dead tissue covering the wound. Uh, it's usually white or yellow in color. It's kind of, well, you, you can see the picture. I won't go more into detail on it than that. that I think that's enough. Eschar is dry, dead tissue. It's typically black. It can be gray or ashy colored. It looks like a scab. And in order to heal a wound, the first step is that dead tissue has to be removed before new tissue can start forming in its place. So step one, we have slough or eschar we get rid of. Step two is we hopefully begin seeing granulation. Wound types. We're going to be discussing four basic types. The uh, arterial, venous, diabetic, and pressure wounds. Most wounds develop in the lower body. If you have heard the term before, uh, your legs are your second heart. Your body functions somewhat with the need for your legs to help assist pumping fluids in the body. Also, that's basically it's, it's the farthest away part of the body. So the fluid dynamics involved mean that pressure builds up in the lower body more. So what are the risk factors? Now, if you remember back to Unit 1 when we talked about doing the assessment and the Braden skin risk and the other skin assessments that can be done, um, a lot of those, that's what the, the risk, the skin assessments are for, is uh, determining risk factors of wound development. So the risk factors are reduced mobility, reduction or lack of sensation. Remember we said that you're constantly fidgeting, moving. If you sit too long on something, it starts to feel numb or sore. Also, without you being aware of it, your body is constantly shifting around and moving a little bit. I can never say that shifting around without kind of... It's so... You're constantly moving and relieving pressure on certain spots. If you've lost that ability, you would be at a higher risk for developing wounds. And also, the reduction of sensation means that you would not know that you were at risk or you were de developing pressure. Malnutrition, I said now, I will go into this again. Malnutrition would, does not cause wounds. That's a myth. 
it doesn't cause wounds. It does increase your risk, though. A malnourished person is a much higher risk of developing a wound. Uh, compromised vascular supply, compounding health conditions, right? The, the more diseases and comorbidities a person has, the higher risk they are for developing more. And hey, guess what? Advanced age is a risk factor also. So part, uh, part one. The first wound is arterial wounds, ulcers. I, I'm going to be vacillating, by the way, between ulcer, wound, and injury. They're all the same thing. The terminology changes once in a while. Right now, injury is, is the go-to hip term. So arterial injuries are uh, the car, they're caused by decreased blood flow due to the arteries becoming blocked over time. So blood is in an arterial wound. Remember what arteries and veins do. In an arterial, arterial wound, easy for me to say, blood is not getting to the area. This causes... Um, the uh, progressive blockage over time causes tissue necrosis. Uh, the signs and symptoms, and these are actually distinctly different from each other, are a uh, neat, deep, hole punch look. If you remember, if you saw that picture in the last one, it, it just, it's like somebody just popped a uh, punch out of that. The area around the wound will be dry and cold, because remember the issue is that the blood is not getting there. Uh, the skin may appear cracked or dry, it's extremely painful, uh, and that does stand out in wounds as we go forward. It's amazing how many of these will develop into very large, unnatural holes in the body that don't really bother them that much. Arterial ulcers hurt, uh, and the pain can be alleviated by dangling the legs. Because again, remember, the issue, one, they're all most commonly in the legs. So if you dangle the area that is has the wound you're helping to increase the blood flow to that area. So it alleviates some of that pressure building up behind it and it gets some flow to that area. Uh, the second one is venous ulcers, which are um, the exact opposite of arterial ulcers. Remember, again, right, the arterial ulcers were that blood couldn't get to a spot. Venous ulcers mean that blood can't get away from that spot. So it builds up over time and starts causing damage to the uh, the veins, to the valves in the veins, and it can kind of, it ruptures eventually. The uh, signs and symptoms of this one are shallow, uneven edges and weeping, because remember that's pressure that's pushing out against the skin, so it starts to ooze out over time. And it's associated with edema, varicose veins, and like scaly alligator skin is the term to it. Uh, and the pain can be alleviated by elevating the legs for the same reason that dangling works in arterial wounds because lifting up the area, it's alleviating that pressure and helping the flow a bit. Diabetic ulcers are caused by diabetes. They're from complications from long-term uncontrolled hyperglycemia. They're a combination of neuropathy, poor circulation, and suppressed immune function. And they're the most common reason for non-traumatic limb amputation. And I do mean this is like a very distinct possibility. If you have a diabetic who's non-adherent, then they run a... Once a wound opens, it's often a downhill slope from there for a while until the, uh, the treatment team can get ahead of the wound. And it's as icky as that sounds. Uh, the signs and symptoms of this are raised uh, round borders. They're associated with cracks, blisters, and sores. They um, appear red and warm early, and then they progress to eschar and, and gangrene. And there's very minimal pain to these. Uh, the most common reason, or the most people will most often realize they have a diabetic wound when somebody else points it out to them. Or you may have heard stories of somebody noticing they were walking around leaving blood on the floor. They just don't know. They've lost the sensation in, in the limb. It's been injured. They were not aware that it happened. And, or the wound has been developing for a while. Again, they weren't aware because, you know, how often do you look at the bottom of your foot, right? And somebody else had to point it out to them or they noticed blood or something like that. Their sock was wet, something like that. Okay. Pressure. And I'm also very proud of this pun. This, this is the one that you'll spend the most time with. Uh, the pressure ulcer, lots of terms for this too. Pressure injury also, 
pressure ulcer, decubitus ulcer, decubes, bed sores, pressure wounds. These are localized injuries caused by pressure or pressure and shear. They do make a distinction between those. So where do they develop? Everywhere. Uh, any place in which the skin covers a bony prominence, ankles, elbows, the back of the head, any areas which bear weight. The most common two are the heels and the coccyx or sacral area and areas which receive pressure. And this is not a lot of pressure. I have personally been, a, I won't say seen, that sounds kind of, but yeah, I guess seen. I've been on care teams for people who have developed wounds uh, from eyeglasses on either their nose or in the back of their ears, from uh, cannula, nasal cannula for oxygen tubing, toes from their bed sheets, catheter um, wounds from, pressure wounds from catheters on their thighs. There we go. And forearms from IVs. Uh, it takes very little pressure at when you are at risk already. So what's so bad about them? Uh, they can develop in less than two hours. As they happen very, very quickly. They can, at least. They are very, very hard to treat and cure because a person that develops them is already at risk, already has those compounding risk uh, factors, it makes it that much harder to then heal them again. They severely negatively impact a patient's quality of life in and out of the hospital. I, you know, imagine that you have a large open area on the back of your foot or on small of your back, your backside. Uh, think about how that would be to live like that and how careful you'd have to be around everything with something like that. It increases the risk of morbidity and mortality and it increases it dramatically. So, um, force terms, as I said, they are particular about, well, about the terms and how a wound develops. So force is exactly what it sounds like. It, it's pressure on an area. Uh, friction is resistance generated by two, uh, by rubbing the body against another object. Shear is a little bit different than friction. Friction is like the buildup of heat and, and damage from rubbing two areas. Shear is a really fast pull. Uh, this often happens when somebody's doing a, or a group is doing a transfer with a sheet, you know, they're lifting, scooting a person along a bed or off of one, and they'll, the skin will pull against the sheet and tear. And a skin tear is exactly what it sounds like. It's skin tears. Um, I won't do a picture of that. I, I find those really icky, and I feel like your imagination will take care of that for you. So, really quickly, and before we go forward, why did I tell you all that? <laughs> right? And we're going to stages here. Why, why am I telling you that? No one's going to ask you to come diagnose a wound for them or, or stage it or anything like that. But I do think it's important that you understand what the terms are when the team is talking about them and... Uh, Identify the, ter identify the terms, understand what they're talking about, and know what you can do as a member of the care team. So pressure wounds specifically are staged on severity. The severity is determined by how wound, how wound the deep is, how deep the wound is. The staging is done from one at its least severe to four, which is the most severe. Uh, stage one is a reddened, reddened area that is non-blanchable. It doesn't turn right white when it's pressed on. Man, my, my language tonight, right? I just, my tongue is not cooperating. So if you press on your own skin, I'm not going to be able to show you this very easily. No, I'm not going to. Press on your own skin anywhere, and you'll notice that you have a white spot that develops that then fills back in very, very quickly. So if you have a stage one, when you press on that area, one, it'll feel kind of soft and mushy as opposed to your skin. If you press on like a fleshy area like your palm, it'll feel tight, it'll resist, and it'll bounce back. Uh, and at stage one, you won't get that. It'll just, it feels kind of like a stress ball, I feel like, and it press it in, and it, it's not going to go. It, it'll scooch in, and then it won't snap back, and it won't blanch either. Uh, stage two is blisters or open sores. This is when the epidermis has been opened and the dermis is exposed. Stage three and stage four are what are called full depth injuries. Stage three is that it's completely penetrated the dermis. Muscle and fat are exposed at this point. Uh, stage four is a wound that's open to the bone. Uh, maybe 
you know, you may have at this point deep tissue, ligament, tendon damage, maybe damage to the bone itself. I remember a wound nurse that was a giving a less a continuing education course that I was part of. And she said, if you have your one of your probes and you reach down and tap it and it goes tink, 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 it's a stage four. That's always stuck with me. There's also suspected deep tissue injury. This is a pressure injury that's occurred, but the skin hasn't actually opened. So we don't want to treat it like a stage one where, you know, which is defined as the skin hasn't opened yet because we know it goes deeper than that, but we don't know how far it goes. And obviously, I mean, the only way you could know that is to open it, and we ain't going to do that. So we're going to treat it like it's a deep tissue injury, even though we're not sure. Unstageable full thickness is the same thing. This is when you have a very obvious um, plug, if you will, of slough or eschar that you can tell. I often see these on heels, you can see it, you know it's really deep in there, but you don't know how far, and again, we're not going to pull the plug out. That used to be considered the correct therapy, and it's not anymore. So you're going to treat it as a deep tissue injury. You're going to let it heal over time. Hopefully that plug comes out by itself. This can keep the area clean, protected, and provide good nutrition, which, which we are getting to. And finally, the mucosal membrane injury. This is a newer uh, classification, these can't be staged. And these are in an area that's, you know, mucosal membrane. If you think about uh, the interior of your mouth, on your cheek here, nah, there's no bone or anything. To, there are no layers of skin to really evaluate in the same way. So it's treated also like a deep tissue injury. These are typically caused by pressure from medical devices, NG tubes, catheters, things like that. Okay, so the treatment for it, right? There isn't one one standard one. There's a lot. The uh, most treatments really involve trying to assist the body's natural healing, healing abilities as much as we can. Now, there are things where well, you can cover it. There's meta honey. There's silver. There's different things you can add. Well, not you, but different things that they will add. Your job is to keep them new, uh, nourished while they heal. So, uh, treatment con continued. Again, the uh, a wound increases comorbidity risk by quite a bit. So, we're going to manage all the other comorbidities as best we can while they're healing. Uh, we're going to increase mobility as much as possible. This may mean encouraging the person to get up if they can do so. It may mean going in. I remember we discussed hydration in the R&R &R times when staff will go in and rotate somebody who can't move themselves that this is why they're doing that uh, debridement if we have dead bordered tissue I, I don't see that as often anymore unless something is very very bad nutrition support is critical and we'll get to that wound vax and negative pressure and wound vax and negative pressure are ways to remove dead tissue from a wound and keep it clean there are some alternate therapies. Um, there are sterilized maggots that are used to put on a wound and used to eat um, eat away dead tissue to remove it. And there are leech leeches used to uh, increase blood flow and filtration, put them around a wound that is caused by blockage to increase blood flow to that area. Okay, so MNT for uh, wounds. Wounds are extremely catabolic and... Uh, more so than almost anything else. The only things I can think of that come on a par with wounds are uh, cancer and hemodialysis. They're just that catabolic. So the standard energy recommendation is 30 to 35 calories per kilogram. And if you're curious about that, you know, take a second, think about how long that would, how much that would be for you. you just, just use yourself as a yardstick. What would that be like? It, it's a lot. Uh, for it's one to two grams. The, the recommendations will often say one to two grams. The breakdown is for one and two, stage one and two. It's one to 1.5-ish grams. Um, for three and four, stage three and four, it's 1.5 to two calorie, or, sorry, grams per kilogram. And 
they often say 30 to 35 milliliters per kilogram of body weight, but I mean, honestly, it's also just one calorie or one milliliter per calorie at this point. It's the same recommendation. So you will run into um, some micronutrient treatments for wounds also. Vitamin C, remember discussed earlier, vitamin C is essential for collagen production. At stage one, for stage one and two, the recommendation is 100 to 200 milligrams per day. And uh, for stage three and four, it's 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams per day. Now, a quick note on that. Well, let me try that first. Sometimes you'll also have vitamin E added to recharge the vitamin C. There's no actual recommended dose on that, though. Uh, important to note here that vitamin C everybody kind of flip-flops on vitamin C. We're not really 100% sold on how beneficial it is. It's a lot like we discussed for uh, the immune system. Is it beneficial to the immune system? Maybe if you're depleted or conditionally short, but maybe not in the long haul. The literature is very, very mixed on vitamin C for wounds. At the moment, at time of filming, the Academy stance is pro-vitamin C. Um, but it has changed twice since I have been working, so I'm going to prepare for it probably to change again in the future. Vitamin A is also one that you may see. Uh, it stim stimulates epithelialization and immune system response. And why I could say that one when I couldn't say wound, I do not know. Uh, the recommendation is 1,000, or sorry, 10,000 to 50,000 international units a day for up to 14 days. Remember that A is a fat soluble vitamin, so you do not want to go to town on A in the same way you do or you can on C, because any C that isn't needed is just going to be pitched out. But A is going to stay in the system, so be careful with that. Zinc is important to collagen, RNA, and DNA synthesis. The recommendation for that is 220 milligrams a day for up to 14 days. That's the, the standard. I, the 14 days is the standard. I often see wound teams go past that with the zinc. And we'll actually get to that as part of Owen's triage dictum, which is coming up in the next part. Arginine and glutamine are, um, they can be conditionally essential if they're, cast your mind back again to metabolic nutrition, uh, they, they can be conditionally essential because they are more needed in wound care. So the body's uh, sources uh, may be depleted and dietary intake may not be able to keep up with needs. This is what is in things like arginate, juven, they're providing hydro, hydrolyzed amino acids, specifically arginine and glutamine are in those mixes. I told you, see, wasn't terrible, right? We got through it. So there are four types of wounds, arterial, venous, diabetic, and pressure. Wounds are not caused by nutrition. Do not let anyone tell you that. They're not. If you have a patient that, ha and actually you will at some point, if you're working in geriatrics, when you have a patient that develops a wound, it's not something you did. It's not something you could have prevented, okay? The dietitian always gets a heavy load in the wound team. There is no gold standard for wound treatment and care, but wounds are incredibly catabolic, so proper nutrition is essential for healing and repair. That's wounds. I will catch you in the next one. Y'all have a great day. Bye.